Good evening. I, I'm hoping my voice travels to the back. Can you hear me at the back? Do I need a mic on? <laughs> Maybe you won't want to. But uh, welcome to all of you to this, the 17th annual Elizabeth Mambo Jay-Z Ocean Lecture. Now, before I launch, may I remind you that uh, Dalhousie's University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. My name is Mike Butler. I have the pleasure of being the director of IOI Canada, uh, the International Ocean Institute hosted by uh, Dalhousie University. Uh, usually, this lecture is delivered around about Ocean Day, i.e. June the 8th. But for logistic reasons, we have planned it uh, today. Uh, we have the uh, pleasure of, of a few students, actually, I think, uh, here, though uh, everybody looks young to me, but uh, uh, hopefully there, there's uh, plenty of students here. Anyway, that was one of the, one of the rationales for, for having it around this date, so that's, uh, that's great. Um, now, please note that this session is being uh, recorded by Panopto. I'm sure you all know what Panopto is. Nodding? Yes, oh yes, so oh, good, you know, I haven't a clue what it is. But anyway, I gather it's uh, brilliant and uh, it will be, will be recorded. Um, uh, also, please note that uh, we will be uh, taking photographs. And Sylvia, who is, would you just raise your hand, Sylvia? The official, uh, official photographer. Now, we're very pleased to have Sylvia with us because she is, in fact, an alumna of IOI Canada from our 2013 course, and she's now back here doing a PhD. So that's, uh, thank you very much, Sylvia, for being with us. Um, many of you will not know anything about Elizabeth Manbojezi. I know that Anya and <laughs> Boris in the front do. do just just hand, put your hand up if you know anything about Elizabeth Manbojezi. Woo. That means I'm not going to, okay, I'll just talk for one minute then. And I'm, no, no, I, I've, uh, I was thinking that there, there would be you know, hundreds of students, etc., and I'd have to give you some background about her. But uh, anyway, we are celebrating, obviously, Elizabeth Mambor Borgesi, and I'm going to give you at least a brief rundown on Elizabeth and on the, her development of, of IOI. Uh, she, as many of you will know, well, as many of you do know, she was the daughter of uh, Thomas Mann, Nobel laureate, Club of Rome men member, um, where she authored a 1986 paper, The Future of the Ocean, that some of you might have read. She was a key member of the Law of the Sea conferences in the 70s and 80s, friend of Arvid Pardo, the Maltese ambassador at that time uh, to the UN, who, if you remember, well, you know about anyway, presented his famous speech on the common heritage, heritage of mankind to the UN in 1967. 67? Yes, Boris is nodding. I'm trying to remember that one. Um, Elizabeth established the IOI in Malta in 72. She was well aware that the developing countries that were being ignored in the Law of the Sea uh, conferences um, through their lack of professional expertise, hence the need for training. Now, in the early years, the IOI provided secretariat support for the Pachamin Maribus conferences that influenced the Law of the Sea conferences, uh, negotiations rather. Unfortunately, PIM, as we call them, Pachamin Maribus conferences were, uh, well, ceased about five years ago, which is, I think, a great, uh, great problem because the regional directors of these various IOI training centers, we don't have an opportunity to see each other, which the PIM conferences certainly provided. Um, the first ocean governance training program was delivered in Malta in 1980, uh, and that year Elizabeth was appointed senior research scholar uh, at Dalhousie and followed by a position as a professor of, uh, of political science. Uh, she established IOI Canada that same year in 1980, and we've been hosted by Dalhousie since that time, so that's, what, 43 years? I wasn't there at that stage. Um, um, in 1981, um, IOI Canada delivered its first annual ocean governance course at Dalhousie. Initially, that was a 10-week residential course. We now have it at eight weeks. This has, this has conti or continued for 40-plus years, and unfortunately, COVID uh, curtailed that, and in the last two or three years, we've been uh, presenting online programs that continue to date, and unfortunately, they're not going to be, won't be in a residential one next year, Hopefully, in 
in 2025, we'll get back to our eight-week program here at, uh, here at Dow. Our mission to promote responsible ocean governance and sustainable use of coastal and ocean resources in Canada and world worldwide. Uh, our goal to develop the capacity of individuals, institutions, and communities to accomplish that, that mission. Our key programs, uh, you, some of you will know about some of them anyway, the eight-week ocean governance uh, residential course for middle-level professionals uh, at Dalhousie. They, they, they reside here at Dow. And we have about uh, 800 or near that number of uh, IOI Canada alumni from over 100 countries. Um, we also have delivered on what we call online, at least I call, online refresher courses, otherwise known as continuing professional development, CPD courses, for our alumni worldwide. We are now doing, in the, at least in the last three years, online governance, ocean governance courses for, again, middle-level professionals throughout the world. Um, we have also done, we also have, at least in for uh, five or six years, the Ocean Governance Academies in Hainan, China. Now, these were aimed at participants from ASEAN countries, not just China. And these were planned and developed in collaboration with the National Institute of China, South China Seas in Haikou, uh, Hainan. And the lady who really was the powerhouse behind that is the one who's taking photographs now, Sylvia. I, I worked with Sylvia for many, many days and months to uh, involve with the, the academies. And they were run two, two programs, two ten. The idea was they wanted to compress our eight week course into 10 days. Um, you can imagine how that one worked out. Um, anyway, in 2015, we had two, two academies, and in the next three years, there was one, one per year. And then in 2019, uh, uh, COVID attacked us, and uh, so there's been a hiatus. But maybe they will be continued, and hopefully we'll be seeing the, uh, the boss man from the National Institute of South China Seas, Dr. Wu, hopefully in, in, in this coming months. And maybe we'll be talking about... Uh, um, continuing those, uh, those academies. Sylvia would know more about that. And most recently, training on ocean governance for indigenous peoples. We had a first uh, program in uh, last December. We have another one coming up uh, in October, which is going to be a tremendous challenge. Uh, all of you, who, or many of you perhaps, have, uh, are used to uh, training programs with indigenous peoples. It's an uh, interesting, uh, very interesting challenge. Um, let me see, I, I don't want to I, I try and shorten this up. Um, unfortunately, Elizabeth died in, in 2002, and to celebrate her centenary in 2018, I, IOI Canada prepared a book entitled The Future of Ocean Governance and Capacity Development. It's the only one I've got, so I'm not going to hand them around. Um, many of the people in the audience actually contributed to this. There were 80 people, just over 80 people, who prepared uh, chapters of this particular book. Just, just for interest, those who actually contributed, please just raise your hand. Look at that. You see, that's part of the... <laughs> that's 5% of the authors anyway. Anyway, it's, it's a very interesting book and highly recommended. And by the way, the uh, launch ceremony was held on campus in, in 2018. And there's a super uh, video of the launch ceremony. Uh, Paul Withers, who you probably know from CBC, he actually attended our course. So we, we, uh, uh, we're very proud of Paul. Uh, anyway, he chaired it, and it was a very successful launching ceremony. Boris was on the panel. Uh, you remember that, I'm sure, Boris. It, so please look at, go on our website and take a look at, the, uh, at, that, um, at that video. And now, <clears throat> final point. Um, why is Halifax ideal for IOI Canada? You're probably wondering why we're here or why Elizabeth chose this place. Um, firstly, Dalhousie's outstanding generosity to us over decades. Uh, the well-established uh, fact that Dalhousie, one of the foremost universities when it comes to oceanography, both the uh, natural and social, social sciences uh, involved with the, with the ocean, this has uh, provided IOI, IOI Canada with a wealth of lecturers. One of the great things that, well, why I'm so lucky is that uh, many of the people sitting in this audience, I'm looking around there, 
uh, probably half of this audience have lectured on IOI Canada programs. And we're, we're very lucky to have you, and it's, uh, that's why it's been so successful. Now, <clears throat> the, the other great thing about locating here is the fact that uh, they, I think they're four or five universities nearby, and again, we, we have access to them. Bedford Institute of Oceanography, o Oceanography that you know is the foremost uh, uh, federal institute in Canada. Plethora of federal and, and provincial departments, research institutes, the uh, Port of Halifax, the military, um, and so many, other, so many other institutes associated with the marine sector. Um, the coastal environment is second to none. The options for field trips are fantastic. So in, su in summary, I couldn't think of a better location in the world for IOI Canada. If anybody has better ideas, do, do let me know. And by the way, just when I finish on EMB, uh, IOI Canada, um, we are one of five training centers globally. We're the one, well, it's we, we presumptuously believe we're the main one uh, in that we have a sort of global perspective on ocean governance. The other ones tend to be rather more locally focused, and they are in Brazil, Malta, uh, where else have we got? Thailand, China, South Africa. So if any of you are in those countries and need, need ocean governance training, you know where to go. Um, enough, that's enough about IOI Canada, but please view the exhibits there's Elizabeth behind me, and there are other ones outside, and you interesting, interesting reading. Um, now, why is this evening's lecture so important? Um, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you, but let me refer to a few quotes before I introduce Dr. Dr. Wade, who will have some of the solutions. Um, a week ago today, the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, told the Climate Summit of Leaders at the UN General Assembly that time was running out to tackle climate change. Many of you, I'm sure, will have read that article. Um, and as a result of that, one of his quotes um, goes as follows. Um, that time was running out, as I said, uh, on, on climate change, thanks in part, and I quote here, to the naked greed of the fossil fuel interests. So if you've got money invested in Exxon or whatever, please feel embarrassed. Um, and also, with the Climate Summit COP28 due to take place in Dubai, Later this year, and you're probably going to be there. Boris, you're going to be there? Um, he, he again went after the uh, delegates and said, look, for goodness sake, let's do something about this. Now, with that ra rather sobering admonition, I now have the pleasure of introducing the presenter of the 17th Annual Elizabeth Mann Bob Bogesi Ocean Lecture. Now, Dr. Anya Waite uh, will in a few moments address the topic a framework for ocean climate action. Now, Dr. Waite's impressive resume can be found in the little brochures that you were all handed, so I'm not going to embarrass her by taking you through that. But as you know, um, Dr. Waite is the Associate Vice President of Research Ocean at Dalhousie University and the Scientific Director and CEO of the Ocean Frontier Institute here at Dal. And may I remind you that Dalhousie received a historic $154 million investment from the Canada First Research Excellent Fund earlier this year. I can't even conceive what $154 million looks like, but have you spent it already? No, no, no. no. Um, the, the idea was to, at least the idea for the program, is to study the ocean's pivotal role in climate change. Um, the Ocean's Frontier Institute will be leading that study. Now, Dr. Waite is eminently qualified to lead that program. For example, she is co-chair of the steering committee of the Global Ocean Observation System, GOOSE, the first woman, woman, by the way, at the head of that body since 2011. That's 2011. She sits on the boards of, board of Canada's Ocean Supercluster and the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction Response Network, MEOPAR for short. Um, she is also co-chair of this special committee on oceanic research, which is SCORES, working group on biological ocean observation system, and so much more. <clears throat> We're indeed fortunate that uh, this evening's speaker agreed to join us to consider a cr critical existential issue, namely climate change, and specifically a framework for ocean climate action. Uh, I can't think of a more pressing global challenge, in fact. So with great pleasure, may I introduce Dr. Anya Waite. Now, unlike 
mic, I'm going to assume that I need to use a mic. So I hope you can hear me. Is that too loud? Just okay. So thank you very much, Mike. And I, I hope that Iowa feels here a home here at Dalhousie. And it's it's an august institution that we value enormously highly. And it's wonderful to have uh, such a legacy of Elizabeth Manbrugge's nested here at Dalhousie. And long may Iowa stay nested here. So. Hope we can work together to make sure that that happens. So today I'm going to talk to you about a framework for ocean climate action and I would encourage you to interrupt me. I'm hoping to only talk for about 20-25 minutes um, and then we'll have lots of time to talk and have questions and so if something isn't clear or you'd like to interject or disagree please please do so. <coughs> So I'm starting with a graph. This is the only graph I'm going to show you, so sorry for the uh, sort of the technical start. But just to orient you, um, one of the questions I very often get is, oh, why are we so worried about global warming? The Earth has been warm before. What's the big deal? So on this plot here, you'll see what the big deal is. So on the x-axis here, you have time going from millions of years ago to the present. 2000, right here. But the scale, it doesn't go continuously. So here's 60, 50, 40, 10 million years ago, and then it goes to 1 million, kind of spread out, and then we're into 1,000 years. So three different scales on there. And on the x-axis there is atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is what we're all worried about when we consider global warming. And that's, of course, what we've been pumping out into the atmosphere with our cars and our buildings. Um, and our fossil fuel industry, but many other things as well. You know, it's all very well to go after the fossil fuel industry, Mike, but I always remember there was a t-shirt, and, and many in this room will remember the Exxon Val Valdez oil spill, and there was a t-shirt that came out at that time that said, you know, the, the whole story was that the guy was drunk, and that's why he ran the ship aground. And there was a t-shirt that said, his driving didn't cause the oil spill, yours did. And I just think that's a great reminder of our own role in, in um, Okay, so why does this matter? <clears throat> well, six, six, 50 million years ago, the Earth was a really different place. Atmospheric uh, concentrations were up at 1,600 parts, parts per million. But it was a really different Earth. There were no humans. There were alligators in the Arctic. So not a place where we can live or would want to live. At least certainly life as we know it would not be possible. And then over time, the ice started to accumulate. There's a whole geologic story there that I'm not going to get into. Um, the ice froze on Antarctica, the expansion of the ice. And then what you can see here is the beginning of the ice ages. So about, uh, let's say about a million years ago, you can see the start of the ice age. Now, when did humans start to evolve? Well, humans actually turns out like a fairly cool climate. They, they do better there. And about four or five million years ago, so about in here, is when the early hominids started to evolve. So this entire period of the Ice Age cycle, so more, more ice, less ice, more CO2, less CO2, as we go through here, um, was a time when human beings evolved very successfully to take over the Earth. So this is our happy place, right? We don't like this. We, we're, not, we're not good at living in an, in an area where there, in a time when there's alligators in the Arctic. And so I'm just, I, I searched around to see if I could find a good, this is sort of where, where we are. And of course, look at all those nasty looking who wants to be there? But, uh, it's, you know, these are, of course, speculative and artistic, but it gives you a sense of this is not a world where we could live. So yes, the Earth did have um, periods when it was much, much warmer than it is now, but there were no humans in that world. And even here, there's, I was just coming across a few stories where basically they said, uh, you know, 700 million years ago, um, animals came out from the sea and started to colonize the land. But 50 million, they wanted to go back in because the conditions were so unpleasant that it was no longer very fun to be a land animal. So that's just to put this all into perspective. So now we come here to you know, the year 1000 and now the year 2000. And now all of this variation that you see in the, in the previous ages, that's all natural variation. That happened through natural accretion of carbon dioxide and the, from uh, biology and chemistry and physics of how the Earth works. Now, we're in a position where we have possible futures that are caused entirely by human-induced cha human change. And so here we are today in this little blue box, and we have choices to make. 
And the choices that we make will determine whether we have this little blip here where we overshoot a little bit and then maybe, maybe the, the earth kind of cools down a little bit again and get our, our carbon dioxide going down. Or whether we go up here, whether we go up here, or whether we go shooting right back up to the point where alligators start to come back to the Arctic again. So we have these choices to make. And I think it's very important that we understand those choices and that we make them carefully. As many of you are already aware, climate change is the biggest risk to people and to our global economy. Some of the main impacts that we have seen recently in big infrastructure loss, even just here in Nova Scotia, some of the recent storms a few years ago blew up the big, um, the big dock in Herring Cove, for example. We've had trees fall on houses. Um, we've had fires threaten people's homes. Uh, climate change has a, a, an enormous risk to our infrastructure. Food security is another issue, not necessarily to us personally, although I have to say, every time we have a hurricane, we realize that we're only a few days away from not really being able to put food on the table. So food security, not even for those of us who have a, a roof over our heads, food security is a non-trivial issue, ultimately. And of course, there's big issues of human equity because climate change doesn't impact everyone equally. People who are living in tents on the commons are hit much more by a hurricane than those of us who have a roof over our heads. And it's even more so for uh, poor populations that live near the coastlines. So human equity takes a big hit under climate change because poor people suffer more and are more vulnerable. So where is the carbon of the Earth? The carbon dioxide of the Earth is interestingly stored mostly in the ocean. So this is all the carbon on Earth. Other than that, it's in the rocks. I've cut out the rocks because they don't vary on a time scale that I'm really worried about here. But what you can see is that most of the uh, carbon is in the ocean. And then here we have sediments, permafrost, and if you expand out that little red thing, it gives you soil, the atmosphere, and vegetation. So all land plants, all of the atmosphere, and all of the soil fits into this little wedge here. And here is the ocean. All right, so, so and not only that, but 90% of ocean carbon is actually locked up in the deep ocean. So what we started to realize is that this is not something that our policymakers or even many climate modelers are aware of. And so we started off to think about, well, if the ocean is holding most of ocean carbon, where is it in the ocean? And it turns out that the North Atlantic has actually absorbed 30% of the fossil fuel emissions that we have emitted since the beginning of the industrial era. And it's partly because the North Atlantic is a really special place. So east and west of Greenland, I don't know if you can see this teeny weeny little dot, but I'm trying to use it as a, as a pointer. Anyway, so east and west of Greenland are things called ventilation chimneys. And it's a really interesting piece of oceanography where as the Gulf Stream goes north, it loses heat to the atmosphere, it cools, and then when, it, when the water gets up here to the really, um, uh, to the really northern area of, um, of the North Atlantic, it starts to sink. It gets more dense, it starts to sink, and in some cases it goes down 2,000 or even 3,000 meters right to the bottom of the ocean. And then it starts to crawl backwards along the ocean basin down way, 2,000 or 3,000 meters below and goes into the southern, ocean, uh, southern basin and goes around the world. But those ventilation chimneys are one of the big places where ocean carbon, uh, uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide that gets um, mixed into the surface water is carried down by oceanography into the deep sea. So very, very important place for the absorption of carbon. The other thing that happens in the North Atlantic that makes it really special is that it has a massive plankton bloom every year. And this is visible from space, this big swath of green on the satellite images where you you, it accumulates every April, May, and then much of it sinks into the deep sea. Much of it's made of these tiny little organisms called diatoms, which I used to study when I was a graduate student. And they sink down into the deep sea carrying their embodied carbon, the carbon that they photosynthesized with, that they grow with, and that sinks into the deep sea. So there's a couple of big reasons why the North Atlantic is a really important place. So when we're looking at absorption of carbon in the global ocean, the North Atlantic is a really good place to start. There's other uh, places in the Southern Ocean that also have these ventilation chimneys, and they are kind of analogous to the ones um, in the North Atlantic. The problem is we don't know whether this is going to continue. 
And in fact, there's cl clear signs that the absorption capacity of the ocean is changing quickly, and particularly that of the North Atlantic may be decreasing. So we, I think you might have heard in the news a about a couple of months ago, maybe one month ago, there were some articles talking about the fact that the, whole, the Gulf Stream may fail. But what they're talking about is, is that circulation that I just described to you where the water moving north and cooling and sinking is actually moving north maybe a little bit more slowly and maybe not cooling as quickly and maybe not sinking as fast. So that whole movement of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the deep ocean could be compromised. There's other implications for that too because the Gulf Stream, if it slows, the Gulf Stream currently keeps Europe warm. I don't know, you know, we're at the same latitude as Bordeaux, right? But we sure don't have the same climate as Bordeaux, sadly. And I know because my, some of my family like to travel back and forth to France. And part of the reason they do that is because it's so much warmer um, at the same latitude in, in Europe. And that's because the Gulf Stream carries that warm water, warm warmth, if you will, from the south, southern part of the North Atlantic and hits Europe. So if the Gulf Stream slows, Europe will cool. And at the same time, the eastern seaboard of North America will have problems with even greater sea, sea level rise than it does now. So there's really big implications for our life going forward, certainly our coastal infrastructure, for shipping, for insurance, and for life on our coasts if this circulation changes. So we need to understand it, and we don't understand it enough is the problem. Um, so let's talk. Oh, gosh, there's even more graphs than I thought. So anyway, I apologize for all these numbers, but they do help us understand a few things. So this is just another view of that. So here is, here is a view of what we release into the atmosphere and what, is, uh, what comes back into the Earth's system as a sink. So sources on the left in red and sinks in blue on the right. And this is from something called the Global Carbon Project that, that basically does a calculation of all the carbon fluxes in the Earth um, every few years. And what you can see is that the total emissions come up to about 41 gigatons or billion tons. Um, and if you look at the land, you can see about seven going into the land sink and about 11 going into the ocean sink. So the biggest sink is the ocean. And you add those up, they come to about, say, 18 or 20, right? Now, the problem here is that so half of the emissions that we pump out into the atmosphere go into the land and the ocean, with the ocean in this uh, particular study being the, the, the larger of the two sinks. So the net growth rate of atmospheric CO2 is now on, on the order of 20. But you can imagine that if this ocean sink fails, let's say, let's say it totally failed, it's probably unlikely for that to happen entirely at once, but let's say if it did fail, then suddenly we'd have 30 atmospheric units going up. So we could potentially have our, the greenhouse effect exacerbated by 50% or more. So we care about this ocean sink and we care about what's happening with time, how it's changing with time. When we realized that many policymakers really didn't understand the fact that there is very, very little, um, that the, the uh, ocean is incredibly important in absorbing carbon dioxide, we started to look at some of the big international players talking about climate action. And those include some important United Nations organizations, including the UNFCCC, the UN United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, the World Meteorological Organization that actually can mandate nations to observe. So the WMO, as we call it, actually tells nations, you must observe this at this resolution. You must observe carbon dioxide at this scale, but mostly, at this point, this was 2021, they almost entirely mandated land and atmosphere observation. There was no ocean observation mandated by the WMO, despite the fact that the ocean was the main actor in climate change. And the Global Ocean Observing System under UNESCO um, was trying to get the ear of these, these higher-ups in the UN system and saying, hold on, ocean is super important. So when I took over as co-chair of the Global Ocean Observing System, I made it my business to make sure that that message was getting through the UN system. So at COP26 in Glasgow, we created a very strong, very simple message, the ocean is missing. And I'll show you what the message looked like. Here's a nice blue planet. And we said to the WM, we have this, so we, as the co-chair of Goose, I get to speak to the parties. And this, so COP is the council of the parties. I get to speak to the parties. When you talk to the parties, you talk to all the nations. And we said to them, the ocean is missing. And this was a very, very simple, very short message um, at COP26. 
26. And then we said, and if you want to solve for climate change, if you really want to understand what's going to happen to the future of the Earth, you need to essentially bring the ocean back. And that very simple message triggered a lot of conversation. And in fact, the next step was that the WMO created a new greenhouse gas study group, and they invited three of us from the Global Ocean Observing System to be on that study group. And since then, the ocean, the surface ocean only, but it's a great start, has now been incorporated into what they're calling the Global Greenhouse Gas Watch, gas watch which is a set of observations that are mandated by nations. That means the WMO can tell nations you must observe this. So we feel like that impact has been critically important and that we now, now we're hoping that they're going to start to observe the whole ocean, but we have to work slowly to get that understanding. So an organization like the WMO, which works on weather prediction primarily, thinks of two sets of observations, satellite and surface. And satellite is, of course, in the, from the satellites, but surface means the land and the surface of the ocean. So they don't think of the ocean as a three-dimensional thing at all. They think of the ocean as a, a, a surface that must be observed to contribute to the climate system. So our education of the WMO, and we had a lot to learn from them as well, <clears throat> but the, uh, the education that we had to give the WMO was, okay, the ocean is <clears throat> not just two dimensions, it's three dimensions, and then it changes with time. So it's actually a four-dimensional system that you need to integrate, and that system is changing more rapidly than it can be observed. So that's the message, and that's the work that we're currently doing to try and take this further. So at COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh, we did the next step, which is to say there is a deep ocean which you are not yet considering, and that is, we started this way by saying most observation of carbon dioxide in the carbon budget is done in the, on the land and in the atmosphere, and ocean carbon, carbon observations are a very, very small part of that. Um, but in contrast, the actual reservoirs of carbon look like this. So the carbon stored in the ocean is 80% of the Earth's total carbon. The carbon stored in the soil or the atmosphere is actually very, very small. So you need to think about that when you're designing your observation system. It's kind of been flipped. You're doing lots and lots of observations in the atmosphere and land because they're easier. We are land animals. It's much easier for us to um, observe the land and, and the atmosphere than it is to observe the ocean. But that's where the carbon is. That's where the change is happening. That's where we need to look. And so then the third message was over 90% of all the carbon that's stored in the ocean is what we're calling deep blue carbon. And that is the message that we took to, um, to Sharm el-Sheikh. So I think the working within the UN system has been super impactful, but there's a whole raft of new considerations that mean that ocean observation is more important than ever before. So we thought that the, the UN system was the main work we had to do and then what happened is you start to look into the UN reports on climate change, the I, uh, what they call the IPCC reports, and what they say is it's not enough to just cut our emissions. We need to start sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere or we're not going to be able to keep the global climate at the two degrees warming. Now, how do we suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? There's been a whole lot of attempts to do that on land. So, of course, trees do that beautifully. They take carbon dioxide and photosynthesis. They build up their, the tree trunk. And, and a lot of people use trees as a carbon sink that you can sort of... So when you, buy, when you buy an airplane ticket, there's a little thing you can take that says, you know, buy an offset. Well, very, much, very often those offsets can be things like tree planting because you're assuming that there's going to be a certain amount of carbon that goes into a tree. The problem is... On land, there's been all sorts of fraud around the use of carbon sinks, and in some cases, companies have gotten themselves into real hot water because they think that they're buying a carbon credit, and in fact, it's fraudulent. So they sell the same tree three times, or they sell it once, but then they burn it up, right? For example, that's happened. In both cases, those things have happened. So let's look at the ocean. The ocean is the biggest carbon sink on Earth, and therefore is one of the best places to actually suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But it is even more complex than on land, and even more we need to be cautious and careful and do things correctly and make sure that we're working with the absolute top scientific advice before we get into this. But this is the only way to really do it. And 
I have some views, obviously, the, the carbon capture and storage, some of the techniques that are being considered, like these huge machines that will suck carbon dioxide out of the air. In many cases, the, the amount that they're actually doing is tiny, it's inefficient, it costs a lot. Um, whereas a lot of the work that's going on in the ocean is actually much more likely to succeed. But it needs a lot more stewardship than many other types of systems. So let's look at, I'll just mention a couple of them, I won't go into huge detail. There's a bunch of different ways we can do this. Um, we can farm seaweed and then put rocks or the rock equivalents in the, in the seaweed and sink it to the seafloor. That carries all the uh, carbon down to the seafloor. That also, though, carries all the nitrogen and all the phosphorus down to the seafloor. So we need to think about what does that do to the nutrient budget of the ocean. So there's some issues there, interesting issues there. We can also, in some areas where the ocean is actually uh, anemic, there's not enough iron in the ocean, you can add iron. You can do some sort of nutrient fertilization that causes a plankton bloom, just like the one I was telling you about in the North Atlantic, and then that can sink down and that can carry uh, carbon. And in fact, I was involved in the first ever uh, iron fertilization experiment in the Southern Ocean in 1999, and we doubled the carbon flux. But it cost, when you look at the carbon cost of the ship, and, our, and even what we ate and what we, are, what we did, we didn't really do much for the global climate, but we showed that it was theoretically possible to double, <clears throat> double the carbon flux. But people don't want to double it, they want to increase it by 10 times, right? So we're, we're even doubling is considered a little bit weak as an intervention. The other one that's really interesting is what they call um, alkalinity enhancement, and that's basically adding an antacid to the ocean so that it can actually absorb more carbon dioxide chemically from the atmosphere. And this, I think, has actually a lot of promise. And you may have heard there was a little bit in the news a couple of weeks ago. There's uh, some Dalhousie researchers are starting to test this out, out in Bedford Basin at the Tufts Cove outfall. Um, and so far, so good. The problem is, at present, you can't actually measure carbon concentrations that it's being added. So you can do a huge perturbation and not be able to measure it because carbon is first of all hard to measure and then it dissipates quickly. So there's all sorts of challenges in getting this right. So to, there's a lot of o ocean industries that are going to be selling carbon credits. To do that, they need a baseline, an ocean baseline against which to measure this. So let's say I'm an ocean alkalinity company and I want to sell some carbon credits. Well, I sure need to know what's going on first before I try to perturb it, because anything I do is going to have to be measured against the backdrop of what's already there. So how can I sell my uh, carbon credit if the ocean is already absorbing carbon dioxide? And how much, what have I really done to it? I need to be able to show that beyond a, a shadow of a doubt. And so what we're suggesting is that if the world really wants what we can call blue chip carbon credits, in other words, carbon credits that are absolutely solid, done with the best ecology, done with the best science. You need to know that ocean baseline really, really well, and then you need to measure your perturbation or whatever you're going to do to enhance carbon dioxide um, absorption against that backdrop really, really carefully, and you need to make sure that scientists are um, telling you that you're doing the right thing. So this whole uh, marine carbon dioxide removal then has also now necessitated, and it's called MCDR for short, you might hear, hear that term, um, has also made us do a real rethink about what kind of ocean observation systems are going to be necessary to resolve these fluxes. And if we don't resolve them, we can't sell the carbon credits. And if we can't sell the carbon credits, then we're never going to have an industry that's going to do enough to perturb the global climate, which is what we need to do to save ourselves. So it's an, ex an incredibly important piece of work to do. So coming to the framework for ocean climate action. At the Ocean Frontier Institute, based here at Dalhousie, but also with uh, UPI, Memorial University, Université de Québec à Rimouski, and Université Laval, we have two big programs that we have launched to really get into this work. The first is a research program, and I think um, Mike referred to it as the Transforming Climate Action Research Program, which is investigating the ocean's role in climate change. This is the research piece. This is how does the ocean work? Um, how do the different parts of the carbon cycle interact with each other? How does the oceanography determine where carbon is moving in the system? So this is the research part of it. And on this side, we have something that we're calling the North Atlantic Carbon Observatory. This is the observation system needed to support this work. Now, they're, they're quite different things. One is a group of researchers doing a lot of research and training and 
work in the ocean, and one is infrastructure, nations coming together to invest in the observation systems, for example, mandated by the WMO. So one is to investigate the role in climate change, and the other is really to enable ocean-based climate solutions and decisions, both, both so we can understand our climate system, but also so that we can understand and support ocean carbon dioxide removal in the correct and, and uh, valid way. So the research program we're, we're, that we're very lucky enough to land this year, as Mike mentioned, um, has three big objectives. One is to reduce that uncertainty in the in North Atlantic carbon sink. We urgently need to figure out what is exactly going on there and what, how is it changing with time. We also want to make a Canada a global leader in the mitigation of carbon emissions, and that mitigation means avoiding emissions, um, sinking carbon dioxide where it can be sunk, and working with um, a bunch of those di different mitigation technologies. And then ultimately, we also want to pr promote just and equitable adaptation. And that means working with coastal communities to make sure that whatever happens in climate change, they have solutions and answers that are appropriate for their cultures and for, th for their communities. Um, and these are big investments. So we got $150 million from the Canada First Research Excellence Fund, but national and international collaborators <coughs> put in another $250 million. So we're now at a, a, almost a half a billion dollar investment. So that's a lot of money, but what are we actually going to do with it? Um, we're starting with the big um, classic research, oceanography research programs, but then there's a couple of really innovative other, there's a number of different uh, innovative programs, um, but this, these are just a couple of examples. The seed fund projects, for example, are these tiny high-risk, high-gain projects, which encourage researchers to get their best ideas out and tested. So they're very small, they're on the order of 30,000 Canadian dollars per, or, or less, um, but they allow a student, for example, who has a great idea to test it out and also to get a bit of visibility. And then we can help, once we see that work, we can then help them decide where they want, whether they want to commercialize it, whether they want to work on a policy brief, what they want to do from that. So the seed fund is hopefully going to work on the innovation side. We also have a um, big international postdoctoral fellowship program, which basically allows young investigators who are working with scientists to move between countries, so to move um, within our, our big international um, collaborations, mostly with Europe and the US, and also to work with industry. So we have a particular group of in industrial uh, postdoctoral fellowships so that um, young investigators can link their research to, um, to industry outcomes. So what do we do about getting a large observatory set up in the, uh, in the North Atlantic? First, the first thing we have to do is leverage what's there and pull together internationally all the observing systems that exist. So there's moorings, there's arrays, there's gliders, um, and there's floats that already exist in the North Atlantic that need to be pulled together into one system. And this is something that nations can do. So nations can step up and pull that conversation together and say, okay, we're gonna invest in our infrastructure, but we're gonna link to that infrastructure from other nations so that we can be more than the sum of the parts. And you might wanna think about an analogy like the space station, for example, where nations invested in infrastructure that was all in one area for the, for the um, space station, and then all the data information from the space station was for public good. And nations worked together, but they invested individually. Now this, of course, would be much more distributed because we need to observe right across the basin, but you could imagine a simil similar governance um, structure to that. So we want to enhance what's there, and integrate, particularly, what's already there, and then basically boost it up by an order of magnitude. And that's the work we're currently doing in the international space. Um, we just convened a group in New York City um, in June, where we brought together international finance organizations, reinsurance, and the, the world uh, large banks to talk about how are we gonna support this initiative together under a blended finance model that brings in industry, government, and international so the idea of this is to build, scale, and link ocean observation, and also bring it back to linking to the scientific analysis from the research program, to inform that strategy and policy, to build that foundation to scale the marine carbon dioxide removal industry, because every time you move scale, you test something in a teacup, you test it in a tank, and then you test, test it in an embayment. Every time you scale up, you're really talking about a different oceanography. So you can do an experiment in your little 
your little test tube, and that can work beautifully. And then you can do it in a bucket, and it may not work quite so well. And then you do it in a tank, and you're not really sure. And by the time you get to the open ocean, well, who knows? So that means that you need new oceanography every time you go to a different scale. And that's the, what investigators need to kind of get their heads around. So ultimately, we want to facilitate blue chip carbon credits. That's carbon credits that are solid, that are environmentally sound, and that are validated by scientific endeavor. At the gigaton, gigaton scale uh, carbon capture, which is really going to get us to net zero and solve, uh, um, help us get to the, uh, a proper climate future. So ultimately, we also want to de-risk the financial services, insurance providers, and investors that are going to invest in this system. And they are roaring to go. There are uh, philanthropists and um, investors who literally have come to the table and said we have $800 million to invest tomorrow. So if you're going to do that, that's terrifying if you don't have a system that is properly set up and properly run. That can go awry very quickly. And so what we're doing is stepping in and speaking loudly about if you want a blue chip carbon credit, you have to come and talk to us. And so that's the conversation that we need to have internationally. And for the North Atlantic Carbon Observatory, we're on the order of another half billion dollars, um, which we're envisaging it could, uh, investors could provide. But a lot of the time we're looking for international funders, and that's from donor funds, foundations, international governments, financial services, particularly ones that have social and governance and corporate social responsibility, um, venture investors, and also uh, private markets. And these are areas that, as a dyed-in-the-wool academic, I would never have dared to venture into. But now that I see the importance of doing this work, I'm training up very quickly on how to talk to, for example, a re reinsurance company. Munich Ray came to our, our, um, our meeting in uh, New York, and they were talking about how entire parts of the United States are now uninsurable because of climate change. So sea level rise and extreme events being that there's people who simply can't insure their houses anymore. So what do you do in a system like that? And one of, the, one of the challenges they had was the U.S. Disaster Relief Fund, which was continuously stepping in to pay people to stay in places where extreme events were going to continue to happen. And so they said the U.S. Disaster Relief Fund was set up to, to be deployed every once in 100 years, and now it's every two or three. And so the problem with that is that essentially that fund is stepping in between a realistic assessment for people about where they should be living. So there's a whole interesting um, set of conversations that we're having with the, re the, with the insurance companies about how do you set um, the right sort of discussion under climate change where vulnerable communities can't afford to insure themselves anymore. And certainly we need to think about what we're doing with flood, I mean, Bedford, right? We're, we, the whole chunks of Bedford are, are on a floodplain, and people got washed away in the last flood, right? Literally terrifying. So, uh, this is not very far from home anymore. You know, two years ago, I felt like I was pulled, you know, had to really convince people that these things were happening. But this summer, this year, we've seen it in our backyard. We've seen the fires, we've seen the floods, um, and we've seen the. We now have a hurricane season. When I grew up in Halifax, we didn't have a hurricane season. Hurricanes happened in, you know, on the news where the the palm trees were flailing around and somewhere in the tropics, and now they're here. Um, so this is us. This is now, and we have things to do. So let me just recap before I, I thought it was going to be really slow. It turns out, I've, uh, sorry, I thought it was going to be quick, and it turned out to be slower than I thought. So let's think about the benefits to society of really good ocean observation. We have the improved forecasting of extreme events, which is one of the things we talk to the climate forecasters and the meteorolo meteorologists. They all are um, looking for data that's going to help them predict when these events occur. And that's harder and harder to do because the probability of an extreme event is changing quickly, and it's changing too quickly to predict that probability. So they're literally chasing their tails, trying to get to the point where they can predict, and the ocean is not well enough observed to support those predictions. And even now, we're actually seeing a decline in ocean carbon observations in real terms, rather than this order of magnitude boost that we 
And we, of course, we want our climate policies and our strategies to be informed, so we know what to expect. We, we need to know how many kilometers away from the coast do we have to move before we're going to get swamped with sea level rise. Exactly what do we need to do? What is the probability that we're going to lose most of the Nova Scotian forest and we're going to be in a completely different type of ecosystem? What would that ecosystem look like? And then what do we do about it in terms of um, the human population? So there's so many questions that we need to answer for ourselves, and these predictions are critical to focusing our attention on the important areas. The other things, as I mentioned, we want to enable that really responsible marine carbon dioxide removal industry. We want to be able to provide scientific research and um, scientific and research expertise to this industry, and it is for Canada and for the world a significant economic opportunity. We've talked to international business people who tell us that it's a trillion dollar potential industry for the world. It's bigger than the entire uh, fossil fuel industry, potentially. So if we get this right and we do it sustainably, we have a chance also to have a viable economic model going forward. So I'll leave you with this thought. Nations in, uh, united to build the International Space Station. So we know nations can come together to take action when they choose to. How can we inspire that same effort for ocean observation? Thank you. just the carbon credit market, that exact sexy uh, talk right, right there, but you know, the, the traditional industries such as utilities, agriculture, marine shipping, uh, can you talk a bit about what are the opportunities and, and, and challenges there? So I think traditional marine industries are transforming themselves really quickly. If you look at shipping, for example, um, as you know, here in Nova Scotia, we have a company, GIT, that produces a, a beautiful new graphene um, coating for ship hulls, which reduces friction, which reduces um, oil consumption, and which also prevents biofouling, so it reduces pollution as well. We don't have to use copper-based paint. So I think innovation has a huge role to play. One innovation like that has all sorts of multiple positive effects. Um, aquaculture is becoming more digital, so uh, there's a lot of there's a wonderful new local, another local technology where they actually put sensors on mussels, and when the mussel closes because it senses a, a toxin, uh, it sends a signal saying move your fish around, and so it's a it's an early warning canary in coal mine kind of thing in mussels in the in the in the aquaculture farm. Um, signal. So I do think that innovation has a huge role to play here, and here in Nova Scotia we have an amazing innovation ecosystem. As you know, you're part of the Lab to Market. Um, okay. Did you want to say just a little bit about Lab to Market? Because it's a very interesting initiative. We work very closely with Lab to Market, and it's one of the places where innovation and research kind of interact. you want to say two words about it? Uh, I cannot speak for the program anymore. I don't want to program okay. anymore. But right. It is a program designed for researchers. Yeah, so it's a lab to market ocean is a way of, of bringing ocean technology ideas out into and getting them a little bit more tested, getting the researchers out there to, to share their ideas. And many ocean researchers don't think of themselves as entrepreneurs. Um, and I think Boris and I both have been part of the Car uh, Creative Destruction Lab, and um, which is kind of a dragon's den here, based here in Canada, where uh, entrepreneurs go and sell their ideas to investors. And literally, they get a million and ten million dollar raises in, in this room, actually. And what's really exciting about that is, uh, for me anyway, is I started off, um, as I said, very much a dyed in the wool researcher. And when I stepped in there and I realized that the same creative energy that drives research questions, because I'm really excited about solving a problem, 
It's that same energy that drives an entrepreneur to um, bring out a new innovation. And maybe the uh, motivation looks different because one has money attached to it and the other certainly doesn't. <laughs> but it's the same excitement about ideas and about transforming the world through innovation. So I think they're both important. Did I answer your question? slide that we showed, the carbon level was very, very high few, some million years ago. It gradually came down dramatically. What caused it to come down, and where did the carbon go? <laughs> Good question. I, the, my first answer to that is I don't know, because I'm not a geologist, and those are, those are not my curves. Um, but mostly the carbon dioxide is controlled by plants and animals on the Earth and the temperature is controlled, and by water. So what would have happened is the carbon dioxide would have been taken into plants um, over hundreds of millions of years and turned into biomass, essentially. And once the biomass is there, then the, um, it cools the earth, right? So if we could suddenly overnight grow all our forests back, that would make a huge difference to um, the, the climate. Can we say that the removal of a ton of carbon uh, will you know, reduce our, our propensity to uh, increase sea level or uh, mm -hmm. reduce the, the increase in, in global uh, temperature and so on? Can we ever talk about that? And do we need to even talk about that? Well, I think we do. I think you've, you've put it correctly. Yes. We can show through science and through modeling that if you take a certain amount of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we will cool the earth. And that's important, right? So I think the actual price for carbon is, right in my mind anyway, right now, completely way too low. Um, and it's partly because we don't understand the true impact of climate change. Once we start to see that we can't ensure our coastlines, that um, you know, the real threats of climate change start to become clear to us, then the quantification of a ton of carbon changes. Um, and I think it's in the same way that ecosystem, what they used to call ecosystem services, right? So we completely undervalue um, a tract of forest because we think of it, you know, we knock it down and we put houses there and we're not thinking about the ecological loss there because we don't value that system, even in terms of as a carbon sink. So I think once we actually back calculate, when you, and there's some papers coming out that are doing this, um, that are back calculating what we're actually doing to the carbon system, the price of carbon becomes much higher because the risks that we are seeing are much greater. The risks to infra infrastructure, to human life, and to the future of, of the species. And if we think of that, you know, we could literally wipe ourselves out. What kind of a cost per ton of carbon does that represent, right?
actually a little blip that might recover. Are you really that optimistic that we could pull this off? Or well, you know, if you look at that graph, I don't, I don't it'll take me a while to click back, so I won't, but the, the, if you look at that graph, it goes up and it goes down, but it doesn't go back no. to where we are. Even that lowest graph is still a massive per perturbation to the Earth system. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm optimistic because I see so much uptake of our arguments in such a short time. The impact we had at the WMO and other um, venues at the UN, the impact that we're seeing in industry, we're seeing um, industries pivot extremely quickly, um, oil companies to energy companies, um, we're seeing a pivot in the, in the industrial side that's in some cases much more quickly than governments are able to do with their kind of stodgy um, elected, uh, elected governments. And that's, it's inspiring to see what can be done. The other thing is, and it's, all, it's both a, a little bit scary and very inspiring, is some of the entrepreneurs are doing amazing things. And they don't feel fettered by conventional action. Just put it that way. So what we're trying to do is to step in, and they're smart, active, energetic people with a huge, like unbelievable amounts of money to spend, and some of them look ten to me, and they've already made their first hundred million and retired, and they look about they're, they're I think they're like twenty six or something, and they and, and so we're stepping into those conversations and saying wait work with us, and it works. So that's inspiring because you see this energy and this buildup of, of potential and you can see it just ready to explode in the wrong direction and you can step in and you can say, you know, and it, and it, and it can work. Because clever people who want to do the right thing will also listen to a rational science argument if you're lucky. So that's where the optimism comes from because we feel like we're having an impact right now and that's all you can hope for. I mean, I have views, they're my personal views. I think that ocean alkalinity is one of the better approaches, partly because it doesn't directly perturb biological systems, and it doesn't create anoxia, and it does increase overall the Earth's capacity, the ocean's capacity to absorb carbon dioxide um, in a way that doesn't seem, at this point, I would speculate, does not have the same level of perturbations as, as sinking a ton of, of seaweed. The problem with ocean alkalinity is that you're only ever going to get a thousand years out of it. So the whole ocean turns over on the scale of a thousand years. If you have a biological bullet of carbon, let's call it, and it goes right down to the deep sea, as soon as it's embedded in the, in the deep sea sediments, it's buried for 10,000 years. So depending on whether you want a thousand years storage or 10,000 years storage, you probably have a different approach. And then a thousand years is probably the maximum you're going to get out. And the other places, things that can happen is the ocean can then upwell in other areas and then release all that material back to the atmosphere. So ocean alkalinity seems like one of the least extreme perturbations, if you will. And in many cases, we've already acidified the ocean a lot. And so making it more alkaline seems like kind of intuitively like a healthy thing to do, not like a negative perturbation. Um, of course, research will tell. Um, and then I think the biological perturbations are and should be more controversial. They should take a lot more work and a lot more care uh, before we do that. But having been involved in one of the big um, experiments myself, I didn't see detrimental impacts. That was in the Southern Ocean, and we only got a doubling of the flux. So not a hundred times uh, sink that's going to cure climate change for sure. But those are really valid concerns. Hi. <laughs> uh, transforming climate action. So yes, we're going to burn carbon uh, and have to emit into the ocean. But we can do it. We can convince the green side of climate change. It's not occurring. We're um, embedded with misinformation as well. Do lots of things. And we talked to this energy government a few minutes ago. So how does this translate to the field of climate? Is this going to be even more significant than learning about 
Yeah, really, really good question. One of the things that Transforming Climate Action seeks to do in that third theme around adaptation and justice is to tackle some of those really thorny issues. Um, education is a huge answer. It's one of the big answers to this, that question. And teaching the next generation about what needs to happen is not only important because we want them to be empowered to act, but because we want a, a generation that isn't chronically depressed about climate change. And one of the, um, Senator Kutcher, who many of you know, Nova Scotian senator who has been very, very active in the Canadian Senators for Climate Change Solutions um, in Ottawa, um, he also focuses on, he's a psych no, he, he did a lot of work on psychiatry. He's a psychiatrist, isn't he? Anyway, yeah, and he, um, one of the things he points out is that the way to get out of, um, uh, out of depression, out of climate depression, is to take action. And so to empower the next generation to take action is one of the few ways we can save them from that the downer of, of, of looking at this climate trajectory. So it's very important to do that. University professors are not always the best people to do that work. You know, some of the work that is done by Ocean School, for example, that Boris has founded, um, takes ideas of ocean and that we've been working with Ocean School to develop carbon-related products to go into schools um, so that we can train the next generation um, to think uh, about climate change in a different way. But we also need to give them agency. And that's, I think, the answer long-term. So we need to think about how to, how to do that. I think, you know, to me, uh, I talked a lot about the work we're doing internationally, but we also, we also work within Canada. We hope we're, M Monsieur Guilbeault, our environment minister, is coming, I believe, on the 10th um, of October, and we're hoping to talk to him about the work we're doing. Um, we also talked to Nova Scotia. Nova, Nova Scotia government is a big uh, sponsor of Transforming Climate Action, um, so we talk to them on a regular basis. I think all levels of government need to be in the dialogue. That's exactly right. And so one of the uh, initiatives that Boris and his colleagues, well, you can talk about it yourself, but there, there's something where we're, they've come up with an idea called Climate School. So following on from the success of the beautiful work that Ocean School has done with the National Film Board, uh, moving into a concept called Climate School, which is going to bring new uh, curriculum into maybe six to nine, um, grade six to nine. Yeah. And uh, those just happened. So the problem is a lot of the, car the products that are, the good products that kelp produce are often uh, carbon rich products. So it's very hard to take the products out of the kelp without taking the carbon out of the kelp. Not, not impossible, and there are some people looking at, at, at doing both. But it's, it's tricky. I think we have one question at the back. Yeah. Peter? Oh, sorry. I think if we do, we failed. The whole the, the cause of mass extinction of animals, and we're we're we've done it completely wrong, right? We obviously have to do enough work up front that we know 
enough about what we're doing that we don't cause that kind of mess. Yeah. I really enjoyed your talk, but what I didn't see was a schedule uh, related to, to the time that these talk that these sessions are going to go uh, over, you know, whether they go for five years or ten years or twenty years. And it just strikes me that, you know, time is short mm -hmm. and the river is rising. That was the name of a book about fifty years ago. I also this afternoon had my head in the first Club of Rome report by <laughs> Meadows, uh, set in 1972, and essentially some of the same points were being made that you made earlier on. And I just think there's an urgency to this whole crisis that we're in, which is not being expressed properly enough, as either in academic institutions or particularly in governments. And if, if, you, if we don't put the urgency into it, when we now have 8 billion people compared to 3.5 billion people when, the, when that first public Rome report was, was written, we're going to lose it. You know? but, so will there be 10 billion by the time your project is finished? Uh, I mean, uh, how do you build that urgency into the program? I think there's a, yeah, so first of all, yes. Um, we're, the, the Transforming Climate Action Program is a seven-year program. Um, we only have nine more years at current emissions before we're over, we've crossed the threshold of the two degrees. So, right, nine years. If we go business as usual for nine years, we're clicked over two degrees, and there's going to be a big overshoot, and it'll take a long time for us to get back. Even if we immediately stopped emissions at that, all emissions at that point, we'd still have to come back to equilibrium, like it wouldn't be immediate. So you're absolutely right. Um, I think there's a balance between sometimes we get better responses with a driving enthusiasm than we do with a catastrophic threat, right? So I can't agree with you more that all this action is urgent, but we also need to inspire people to take that action in a way that's going to be sustainable. So there's a balance, um, but I don't disagree with anything you said. It is a balance for sure. But it is an urgency situation that we're in. It is, yeah, for sure. Can you just have a question? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, two of the best questions to last. <laughs> well done. So the first question was around um, the deep sea mining, and the second question was around the uh, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, which is a new international treaty um, on preservation of the biodiversity of the ocean beyond our um, economic zones. Yeah, two excellent questions. Um, my, deep sea mining, we, can, we should talk. Um, I don't believe that we need to mine the deep sea. Um, uh, the deep sea takes thousands of years to recover from perturbations. And the economic realities of that mean that I, don't, I have not seen any analysis that suggests that it's a, an economically viable way to get uh, rare earth minerals for batteries. Um, we'd probably be you know, much better off looking at recycling um, some of our devices and going into uh, mining mine tailings. Um, so I think there's better ways to do this than to dredge up the deep sea, uh, and there's a lot of a lot we don't know um, about the deep sea. So I'm not a fan. Um, I have seen some technologies that suggest that they can pluck nodules of, of, of metals from the seafloor without disrupting it. If you could do that, and you could ensure a certain type of density of, of harvesting. That might work, but then you're still dealing with the fact that these nodules have taken millions of years to form. So you're literally taking something that's never going to come back in 100 lifetimes. Um, your other question about the BB&J Treaty, we're right in the middle of a discussion about that. The BB&J Treaty is a fabulous, it's taken 10 years, you know, to your, to, to your point, 
uh, Peter, that, that um, it takes a long time to make those big international treaties, and so we just have to be super grateful that the people who've had the dog and determination, you've got 97 nations agreeing on something. Just think about that, like that's huge. The problem is, of course, then there's all sorts of, it's been watered down and there's been compromises and whatever, but you've got a treaty, right? And that means for us, it means when we're going into the deep sea, we've got a treaty that says nations can act outside their economic zones to conserve the ocean. It means they also have to observe the ocean to conserve it. So when we're talking about deep ocean carbon sinks, the BB&J treaty helps us in that framework. So I'm a big fan. I'm also a big fan of the incredibly patient negotiators it has taken 10 years to bring it to fruition. fisheries yields if, you, if you're fishing right on the boundary in marine protected areas. And certainly that was the evidence in Australia at the time when I was there. There's a huge evidence that marine protected areas brought an increase in fisheries. Um, Boris is probably the right person to talk about that. It's been his uh, research focus for a number of years. Um, and maybe you can mention something about that. Well, uh, so marine protected areas are now used as a tool to uh, safeguard and rebuild biodiversity. Uh, at the same time, protect carbon stocks and rebuild fisheries when needed. So you can do almost two things at once. I mean, you can do it in ways, and uh, there's a global plan um, that has actually uh, was quite uh, developed for this project last year. Um, so I'll be happy to talk more with you um, after the uh, end of this session. to make a few concluding remarks. As you know, Dr. Rahm is a marine ecologist in the Department of Biology, and many of you will know him associated with Ocean School and his work with the National Film Board and the CBC Forest Orioles. All right, I'll make it brief. Uh, not like previous speakers who said they would be brief. I will be brief. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm between you and drinks. And um, I really, and also because I feel the subtext of this series, but especially today's lecture, uh, for me personally, is enlightened female leadership. And I want to thank Anya for the incredible leadership she's brought to the OFI and to the ocean community here in Halifax. And it's very much in the tradition of heroes like Elizabeth Manborghese, who said, it's right on the Dell website, pessimism becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. It is necessary to muster optimism or you can't act. And I think we saw that embodied in uh, what we heard today. And while we have to be very acutely aware of the situation we're in and the precipice we're steering towards, we also need to be hopeful in order to do something meaningful and to take climate action or other action that is needed, such as action for biodiversity, for example. Um, another leading female that is one of my all-time heroes is Marie Curie. And she said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so we may fear less. And it was um, mentioned earlier that I work with youth in our Ocean School program, which is free to everyone to use. It's for all ages at oceanschool.ca. And uh, I see a lot of climate anxiety. And I, I see a lot of environmental pessimism. And children who honestly feel they've been betrayed by us for their future. So I think we owe it to them and their children and their children to really turn this around. And I think transforming climate action is one of many steps we, we, we must take. It's not going to solve the problem by itself, but it's an important step and one I think we should be very proud to be uh, headquartering here right at the House of University where most of us work. 
So that's really all I want to say. I want to thank Anya. I want to thank the organizers. And when I took Elizabeth's class, I came here as a graduate student in 99. And I think it was the penultimate year she was teaching her oceans class at Dow. And I took it, and I saw her in action. And it's something I'll never forget. And we had a conversation about the greatest challenges to mankind. And we did a little poll in the class, and I said, I think it's climate change. And so she said, how can you be so sure? <laughs> Which is a typical thing she might say. And, and I said, I'm not sure, but if it is playing out like it's predicted, it will change everything. And it does. And I think we're in the midst of responding to that and um, very much in the footsteps of this formidable woman. So thanks to everyone, and I'll uh, we'll see you. <laughs>